um, bring uh, people who are making projects in Europe at the moment into the school uh, in a way so that they can talk about them as they are being made rather than um, having uh, some long period before the projects become available for us all to look at. Um, and um, the simplest uh, way of uh, organizing that seemed to be to uh, choose uh, competitions which um, had been judged recently uh, where the results were not known. Now in this case, um, <coughs> clearly the results are now known for the European 3 uh, competition. There was a presentation at the RIBA last night. There's an exhibition running at the RIBA as well of British entries for that competition. Um, so far this year, we've looked at the Holy Island uh, exercise, um, the foyer competition for a site in Birmingham, um, and a slightly peculiar one for a centre for the disability and the arts at the University of Leicester, which was last week. Um, today, um, we're focused on European 3, um, the theme of which was at home in the city. Now, at the AA this year, there have been a number of conferences, which, which, um, one of which was called Home, which um, immediately problematized that category. Um, in the uh, title of this evening, A Topos, I tried uh, by bracketing to have a conundrum uh, of the relationship between place and non-place. It seemed to me that as, as, uh, after we've seen the schemes, that discussion could well uh, uh, progress to be about um, the, how one thinks about home, city, place, non-place, and landscape. It seems that those are actually kind of uh, an important part of the intent behind the European competition, which we may try to uh, dismantle. Um, <coughs> the, the, I propose that the, the running order for this evening is basically alphabetical so that even though there are people here who won prizes um, we don't put them up first we'll just run through as the list on the poster um, uh, Don Bates will show a project his own project and another project from uh, Brie uh, that he'll be followed by Peter Beard and Mark Brearley uh, then Peter Davidson then Mayholm and Julian Lewis then Studio 333 and finally, Jeremy Till and Sarah Wigglesworth. Um, I've asked Jeff Kipnis and Alejandro Zaira to uh, respond to the, both the theme of the competition um, and the individual responses to it. Um, my, my hope is, and these things never quite work out as you intend, but uh, it, that if each individual uh, presentation is confined to, to between 10 and 15 minutes that we get through the projects themselves quite swiftly where you all get a very kind of scant impression of what's being done but hopefully can hold on to the, the key issues that each uh, architectural uh, group has tried to uh, explore um, and that then um, through, through the, cr the, cr the criticism and discussion that follows we can uncover uh, uh, maybe some uh, more interesting Fundamentals. Um, okay, I'd like to hand the evening over first of all to John Bates. Um, you'll have to bear with us as we change over carousels. There will be little lulls, um, but uh, we'll try to run th through things as smoothly as possible. Thank you. Is it this one or the other one? Good. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to actually make this between five and ten minutes because I think it's uh, more important to see some images quite quickly and then go on to some discussion a bit later. The project, there's several things I, I think I need to say if for no other reason that I'm first one up. One is that, I, if I'm not mistaken, every project you're going to see tonight is in a different site and probably more or less in a different country. So any sort of comparisons are going to have to be on quite an abstract level as opposed to the direct material levels uh, as a comparison of winners or losers or so on and so forth. The first project that, that you see here 
It's a project I did with a group of other people, uh, Tufik, uh, a student from Grenoble, uh, Gernot Weckerlin, a student from Berlin, uh, Jonathan, forget his last name, from uh, Montreal, and myself. Uh, this is a project in uh, Mo. It's a small, well, not a small town, a town of about 150,000 people on the east side of Paris. And the project very simply was uh, a more or less urban site just at the very edge of the existing 18th, 19th century fabric of uh, the town of Meaux that was scheduled for demolition because the building fabric was in reasonably poor shape and also directly across from it. I'll, I'll try to explain this through the series of slides later, but I just want to quickly show this is the, the panels that we submitted for the, for the competition. Wrong one. Uh, the site is basically this Cartier right here. Uh, directly in front of it, which I'll show in some other images, was a big governmental center that had just been completed, a hotel that was here. The old part of the town, which has a cathedral, is back over in this area here. And off to the, we off to the further to the east was a big uh, development that had taken place in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s of high-rise housing on green sites, uh, quite large urban development, but non-urban in a sense. So the project was really to take the existing site to change out the scale and to densify it. That was the program I stated. They wanted the densification of the urban fabric, uh, sort of reinvigoration since they had moved this big governmental center down here, which has a palace of justice, it has uh, the ministry of finance, it has a hotel, it has uh, courts and uh, various other and sundry administrative uh, demands. We work primarily in terms of model. Uh, the drawings that we did came in the last four days before we had to hand in the panels. We basically were working uh, through a series of models. This model tries to show uh, a part of the fabric uh, directly responsible. This ex from here up across and back. This was the site as given on the project. This was the new governmental building that had been put in. This was a hotel with uh, offices and shops. These were factory buildings. These were some larger apartment buildings built in the 60s and 70s and the same here. All of this other stuff that you see here is really a sort of 17th, 18th and early 19th century fabric uh, which is has a certain kind of density. This is an important shopping street. Uh, but is actually quite small. It's not like Paris. I mean, these buildings are mostly two and three story uh, structures at the most. Uh, and that's really about it. So the project was really the densification of this, making some connections with this existing school and changing. There was an existing school on the site, but they wanted to change that. Other than that, there were no specifications in terms of program. There were no specifications in terms of absolute building types or housing types. There were no specifications in terms of a mix of programs other than that it was sort of around 60% would be housing and other than that some commercial and uh, uh, mixed-use uh, facilities. I don't know if anybody can see this, so too bad. The, the, these are drawings that are, uh, I, I'm sorry, they're, they're very thin drawings and uh, you know, they read on the panel, but at this scale they don't read. Series of drawings with different sections through our project relative to the site, but it's also an overlay of what was a determining drawing for us in terms of developing the project as a whole. Uh, I'll, tr I'll come back to this in discussion. Uh, this is just a, another photograph of the model. This is trying to show each of the three panels consecutively. And this final panel with three images uh, of the different models. And this little schematic diagram, one of the things that was quite important to us was in developing this, looking at the existing buildings, was to make a sort of uh, sequencing of the, the condition of the buildings in a certain aspect. What we were interested, I guess, to say in two things, one or three things. One was to develop the project out of a critique of lines of how one constructs a logic out of a series of lines that are non-architectural to begin with. The second thing we were interested in was addressing what it means to build on quite a, you know, it's not a grand site, but it's a reasonably large site, 
what it means to try to build one thing and how one begins to achieve some sort of differentiation. And third was in terms of, of establishing a form of densification. Again, how one achieves a densification out of the necessity of a sort of monologic thought. I mean, in other words, us doing the whole project, how could we possibly create a, a diversity, not so much a diversity, but a differentiation of the whole while conceiving of the whole at one moment. So the, the little diagram that you see here was, uh, came out of our analysis of the existing buildings and how, in fact, we could replace buildings over time. So this is really a time scale of about 25 to 30 year period so that, that the project as we designated it would actually take over and replace two or three buildings here, maybe one building here, and a series here. Five, four to five years later, it would begin to take a whole another band and begin to, you know, to try to see in the sequencing how one could infill over a period of time uh, till ultimately this became the whole redevelopment <laughs> with a series of differentiated buildings which could perform different building types and different building functions, but which could also tie together as some sort of agglomerated mass. Uh, this is trying to get a bigger sense of this drawing so somebody could read it. I don't know if anybody can. Um, I can go into, I mean, I don't think it's important at this moment just to say that we took the original, the generating drawings were non-architectural drawings. They came from a mapping of uh, the, the domains of the constellations in the, the stellar uh, charts, uh, redrawing those through a different series of, of transformations so that we got some interstitial spaces between the two types of drawing, the flat drawing and curvilinear drawing, and uh, the buildings and the, the, the massing as it existed on the site developed out of that as a differentiation between these different uh, stellar domains. And this is a rollage uh, combining the uh, a one to, I mean, there's a, it's a site plan at one to 200 as well as a, a site photograph of the model at one to 200 interleaved. Just to go into very quick description, uh, these are some of the building fabrics and there's a description of some of them in terms of housing as they go back to the site. Along this front, there was a major street that was cut through about uh, 10 years ago. So these buildings along the front, some of these are commercial connecting to some of the hotel that's down here. And there's some pedestrian passageways that go through these uh, plexiglass pieces. There were connections because this was a major shopping street across the top that's not part of the site, but part of the, the general context of the, the, the building program. So right now I'm just going to go through a series of photographs of the model because basically that's where we did all our work. Again, just to reiterate, this is the site in terms of the Europan project that extends along this street and down to here. Now because we conceived of, of this as an incremental development, something which infused itself over time, we also wanted to, to insinuate that it also didn't stop at its own boundaries. So the European site is right here, but we also put these elements which began to distribute themselves across the rest of the site and spread out that what we wanted to set up was actually that there was a larger, a larger logic and ordering system in operation that was more than the site as given by European. That the only way to conceive of this was to conceive beyond it and leave traces of that which is beyond while concentrating on that which was the, the actual uh, program itself. So you can, you can see a few of these little guys here and <coughs> down here. There's some that, that come into the fabric beyond over here. Again, these buildings in the front, these are the existing, these were built in the last three to four years. Actually, this one was just finished last year during the time of the, the competition. But they set up a very different scale than the housing and the, the, the warehouses that are on the site. So we're trying to not necessarily mediate, but consider what the, the sense was of slightly shifting, but also expanding the, the, the density and the, the fabric of the city. Uh, but away from what had taken place out in the suburbs.
again this is this is this major thoroughfare that was cut through part of the reason for this whole project was that when they cut through with this thoroughfare at the end of the eighties beginning of the nineties it actually cut off the backs of a lot of buildings so the 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 fabric as it had uh... was left over as resi residual no longer really worked in the same way so part of the the brief for european was in reconstituting this given these new conditions back and forth Okay. That's the first project. Now I'm also going to be presenting a project by another group. Uh, it's a project done by two painters in association with some assistance from a couple of uh, young architects. The painters, their, their name are Ken Rabin and Steve Vitali, and they worked on this together while we were, there was actually, I'm part of a group in, in France, in Brie, and there were actually four of us working on competitions, European competitions at the same time, but each, is a, each of us was working on a different site. This one is also in France, but it's in Mulhouse. And uh, they worked on it with uh, the help of two previous uh, architecture students, uh, Paul Tagliabu and Gwyn Miller. I'm gonna, there's only, I think, about five or six slides. This is their overall panel submission. And I'm just gonna read you the text that they gave to me. It's called Plus or Minus Malouz. I would like in this text to disclose the initial interests of our team in approaching the Malouz project to describe our procedural movements and to conclude with a discussion of the theoretical implications of our act. Our first wish was to avoid all contact with acknowledged acts of town planning and program fulfillment while intending to arrive at conclusions which would nonetheless satisfy such criteria. We set our principal goal to be that of a redescription of the city fabric. Rather than seek out new building forms, we determined that our response would be a proposition concerning a new urban texture. We thus accepted the programmatic requirements, identified their typologies, and determined another path toward our accomplishment. Our first formal movement was made in order to dislocate our, reflexive, our own reflexive responses. We constructed a simple inverted model of the site elevating the canal and several courtyards while forming cavities of all existing structures. We hoped in this way to respond to the town fabric with a renewed sense. We then made both chalk and charcoal frottage of the contours of these cavity forms. As you can see here, these are the models that they made where the, uh, these cavities were in fact what would be the, the inverse form of the existing building. This is the site as given in Malou's and then these pieces that stick up along the side were the canal or uh, whatever else he talked about, the courtyards, and they were elevated as, as forms above a certain gradient level. The presence of these strong initial contrasts began to help us to form an impression of the city in black and white. We then misplaced these drawn traces near their parental forms to begin the disjunctive passage necessary for the emergent restructuring force. The collage of forms near their negative sites left us with a second generation of contours which adhered to and anchored <coughs> their parent forms, the existing Cartier. We continued to withdraw from and reapply to the site these generations of forms, accelerating and mingling the unsettling of growth and decay. The essential act appeared to us next to be the measurement of this field of transition with a schematic and bold form. The perimeter wall was a monolith of the site as a monolith of the site was chosen for this task. The, st the strong contrast in black and white were now linked, in fact, with two agents of change, the distance between a perimeter form and an animated interior object, and the startling encounter between a higher type and its stratified existence in sequential reality. We became interested by this act and by the movements of blockage and passage permitted by the wall form as it describes the course of contemporary living. This is the first panel of the uh, submission piece. So you see the site in the site of Malouz, and you begin to see some of the, uh, the forms that they developed. I mean, perhaps this will be a bit expl better explained in the next images. As the, as the perimeter wall lost much of its monolithic imagery, it provided us with free choices for the creation of interior spaces of various strengths. This interchange became a way of meaning. Formal and spatial types, uh, which we initially identified as pertaining to the program for the site, returned to reconnect to the new generation of the Cartier. 
The reformation process concluded itself by the refinement of certain dominant axes and elevations and by the configuration of the site as a working, as a working order. The Cartier presented itself as a scaled and stratified model of urban desires with village, town, and city forms densely brought together. The presence of the university building, the university building, it's, I can just try to describe. This again is the site, this is the canal that's existing. And uh, the, right at the edge of the site, but permeating into the site as part of Europan, there were existing university buildings. Uh, and so this whole sort of surface along this side here with some of the courtyard. Uh, the reformation, the Cartier presented itself, uh, the presence of the university building imbued the Cartier with its quality of articulated self-observation. Our, our essential act of clarification remained to order those thoughts which have been brought to light as a result of our work together. We offer these preliminary, preliminarily to the city of Malouze in order to contribute to its consideration of architecture as something other than a, as a remedy for housing disorders. We offer our project as a proposal for the for the contraction of the means of the city. As in every living situation, we have sought to wed form to encounter between preeminent types, existing surfaces, and the fabric of pragmatic desire. We propose the construction of a densely modified and programmatic space for the simple purpose of, the prov of providing the city with a view towards itself. The city's growth is considered to be synonymous with its expansion. It is not our notion, but it's simply true that no fundamental growth may occur without the compression of fullness into a seed of enclosure, the form of a renewed life. Instead of offering further expansion, we here propose to put the city to rest with the means for apprehending its movements, acts, and desires. Here in Mulhouse, we organize the city to include a corpuscle of itself, large and small, closed and open, centered upon a perimeter whose black turns to white. This is the plus or minus Mulhouse. This is the, the, the final panel, which shows, uh, I mean, I'll go back. There's a couple of more slides that show some of these elevations in the section going across. These are just some of the developmental drawings that they, they went through in, in working the site uh, between this sort of uh, plus or minus between what was mass and what was void, what was open and what was closed, what was solid and what was uh, court, uh, courtyard. These start to, uh, there's, there's two drawings along here that show a section through the site. This one here, and uh, this, this section that comes <coughs> along here. So part of the, the, the stratification and the, the buildup is also in making a, a sort of reversal of the, of the site in a certain way between itself and what is mass and what's there, also relative to the uh, existing canal and the other fabrics of the building. Okay. Okay, next um, will be uh, Peter Beard and Mark Brearley. Um, just a few minutes to change cars. My name's Peter Beard, I teach here, <coughs> and I used to teach here with Mark Brearley uh, a couple of years ago, and that's how we met. Um, and the work which we're showing, uh, we, we actually collaborated on uh, the Europan previous to this, which was uh, two years ago. And <coughs> the work that, that, that we're showing arises, I think, out of a, maybe some of the themes that we were dealing with when we were teaching together here um, that, at that time, uh, and probably less with, specifically with the kinds of things that we're dealing with 
in the unit here now. Um, the site that we were working with was a site at uh, a place called Mera uh, in Switzerland. It's just outside Geneva and it's quite close to uh, the French border to the uh, nuclear research station uh, at CERN. And <coughs> a lot of it's a housing estate uh, and a lot of the residents of that housing estate work at CERN. So it consists of uh, research scientists, a lot of uh, uh, Swiss foreigners. All right. The spaces of this housing estate, built through the 60s and 70s, are permeated by a deep blandness. The open areas between the blocks have little differentiation. They are a kind of no-man's land, decent, but void and unappropriated. The original planning strategy is evenly and passively ordered around the hill on which the development is built. But at the heart of the site, there is no perception of this raised ground or any active gesture which attempts to reveal it. This contributes to the sense of inadequacy about the centre of Meira. At the scale of the private is the flat, the balcony and the car. At the scale of the public, there exist primarily these void spaces of ground belonging to no one, maintained tidily by contract. These contrast, uh, sorry, this contrasts strongly with a rich diversity of conditions of occupation immediately surrounding the perimeter of the development. To the northwest, the children's farm playground, cultivated agricultural land and sports fields. To the northeast, grazing land with cows, orchards, farm buildings, and the small holding garden spaces of the gravel pit site. To the south, the wooded spaces, more orchards, drive-in shop developments, and toboggan slope. Towards Meiran village, a mixed pattern of new small apartment buildings, private houses, and old private gardens. There is a lack of any spaces which mediate between the extremes of, of public and private, any outside space which might be privately appropriated, or any strong spaces of a distinct urban quality. Our proposals attempt to address all of these issues <coughs> through a radical subdivision and mixed appropriation of the previously described void spaces. Uh, two major new public spaces are created at the centre of the site around the existing shopping centre, forum and ecumenical centre. Uh, so you'll see there's this whole series of slab blocks which are not actually entirely similar uh, but uh, were built over a period of probably about uh, 10 years. This stuff in the middle is a, a kind of shopping mall that got done up in the mid-1980s, I suppose. Uh, that, that is a building which is described as a forum. Um, so there's, there's a kind of attempt to set up some kind of centre here to something which basically is pretty much undifferentiated. The gr these public spaces take the form of raised fields, folded structural plates which represent and articulate the natural <coughs> topography. The ground surface is angled and humped. The two new pieces have a presence like ancient earthworks and allow a readjustment of surrounding space and levels. These are the plans of those two pieces. The spaces between become a more precisely contained and dense location for the existing public buildings with an additional new workshop office with additional new workshop office and shop spaces. In contrast, the upper field areas have an open and complex definition. Table-like, the surfaces and edges work together with objects on or around to plot a range of overlapping spaces. Below are located decks for parking cars. The two field spaces are specific in character one from the other 
One is hard, open, and largely undivided. The other, finely divided, with a mixed pattern of cultivated ground. The proposals include an enrichment of the residential component of the site, with an emphasis on the provision of smaller flats around the central area. A hybrid building type provides the possibility of living and working spaces in close proximity. Paired wings of the taller buildings contain on one side workshop office space, while across a shared hall are small studio and one or two bedroom apartments. At the lower levels, similar juxtapositions occur with workshop, office and shop spaces placed close by and facing the new forum building. A nursery sits alongside garden plots. Public rooms in the town hall addition look across an inclined meadow and are close to domestic spaces. A series of active, named and worked allotment spaces is proposed on the large western plot, which was left vacant uh, by moving to sports fields, and, and also for half of the cultivated raised field. One of the raised fields is cultivated, the other isn't. Garden spaces would be made available by lease to tenants from any of the surrounding apartment buildings. Private flower and vegetable plots combine to become an offering to the public. These garden spaces can also be overlooked from the surrounding buildings and from the pedestrian bridge which passes over the new metro line. There was a new metro line proposed. An extended section of the northern raised field and that's the green piece you see it's an extension over the metro line into this new piece of ground that's, that we've pinched or we were asked to pinch this radical reallocation of ground into a series of private territories restructures a sizable part of the previously void open space taken together with the interventions around the central area, a new pattern of highly differentiated spaces begins to operate across the whole site. The new topography and its occupation establishes a wide range of spatial densities within close proximity and a much richer mix of uses than currently exists. A significant part of the proposal is the provision and articulation of a new network of pedestrian and cycle routes across the site. On foot or cycle, Mayram would be understood in relation to the broadly humped ground of the central area. I was thinking of the pleasure of um, riding a bicycle across this large humped piece of ground and then letting go of the pedals on the way down. The two raised field areas ramp down to the east, allowing direct links between the new metro station and the commercial area, as well as access points to the car parks below. <coughs> Those ground formations incorporate the metro line and the station. Car parking is below those fields and acts as their measure and their structure. a little about ideas about construction. There's a clear distinction between the extensive engineered elements of the proposal, the raised grounds, and the collection of new buildings which adjust that space as a residential work buildings, which adjust the space of the fields and provide the cellular elements of the accommodation. The areas of raised ground are formed with concrete decks of waffle construction which gain regular support from the parking structures below. There's careful utilisation of excavated earth and spoil from the construction of the metro and the lower parking areas. That allows for substantial sections of solid ground 
with which subtle stitching can be achieved between new and existing topography. The eight new buildings which rise above the fields are of a much finer scale and they incorporate delicate curtain wall skins similar to some of the existing housing blocks folded around and meeting solid clad sections which have a more complex relationship to the ground surface and the spaces of the central area. That's what you should have been looking at while I was <laughs> describing that. So that suggests the residential work buildings above, the much finer scale constructions and the engineered pieces below, which here we're seeing fragments of those big humped grounds. Finally, um, I want to touch on two issues which, if anything, are the, were, the, were the strongest issues we were concerned with. First is this question of proximity, of um, revealing and expanding the range of proximities between uh, ordinary activities and the ordinary spaces of daily life. And for example here, the space of the car the domestic space, the work space, and the garden space, and that we would try to establish a much broader range of proximities between those than currently existed. Currently, the dominant relationship is between domestic space and an outside, which is a this contract-maintained uh, public spaces. <coughs> Secondly, and related to that, the question of land, the question of its use and potential appropriation. Again, feeling nervous about any idea of drawing a clear distinction between public and private space. I think a feeling that that's a, a rather forced distinction. Um, These are, in, these are issues that uh, are following through. The question of land, its use and appropriation is something which also connects to uh, involvements in practice, uh, which centers on East London and the Lower Thames, where many of those similar issues emerge, um, questions of the politics of urban change and their spatial consequences of, of that. So those are two themes that I think are stronger, uh, the strongest in the work. This project is for in Dunkirk and uh, an area um, on the outskirts of Dunkirk called Grand Synth that was developed in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, this area primarily consists of these five six-story uh, slab blocks, some 10 to 14-story tower blocks um, that provide a, uh, a homogeneous setting in which this, this suburb predominantly is. This has now been diagnosed as being ill and requiring treatment. And the prescription for that has been these, which are two and three story uh, row houses uh, in the French neo vernacular style, um, <coughs> variously colored. But what these, I think, have done, have simply repeated the undifferentiation that could be said to characterize the original uh, slab blocks and towers, that they simply 
uh, face every direction almost simultaneously, backs to f uh, face fronts of adjacent buildings. So I think that they, they, they repeat the condition that currently exists on the site. Now, what I attempted to do in collaboration with two other people, Alison Smith and Carolyn Shenton, was to simply begin to delineate the area of, of this center that was asked for and was, was actually the site, which was essentially this area here, um, that at the moment has a boulevard that runs across it from there around to here that would not be uh, out of scale in the center of Paris. Um, a new road system has been in, uh, implemented, which I have simply kept, which is this road system here. So the one way to get rid of the boulevard is just make a big roundabout right in the center of it. Now, they, they desperately desire a center because the fear is that this area doesn't have an identity. I'm not sure in delineating um, what I have through this center that it's possible to sustain it in long term as a center at all. So all, well, the, the essential aim that I tried to do was, was by creating um, a series of, of programmatic bands delineated through not only this particular area but extending across uh, some at the scale of the entire area of Grand Synth, simply attempted to, to trace across the site a series of, of, of potential activities. Now, each of these bands was developed ideogrammatically that, so that, that the lines that were used to develop these would be tracings of both their content and their character. They weren't, de they weren't developed in any sort of detailed way um, in terms of for the proposals for the competition itself. Um, so a lot of well, some of the things I might say now um, would, be, would be for subsequent development or negotiation in relation to, to what was possible from this development. I don't see this as a, as a master plan. In fact, it's a very minor plan. <coughs> the bands have been established along a scale of differences, which include the scope of their territory, their periodicity, the activities, and their material. In the areas where they do cross, and they've been drawn so that they do cross in the location of this, this supposed center, the crossings would potentially create an intermix and a hybridity between each of the activities and also the qualities of the line. The two line, the, the, the series of lines um, that are there um, cover landscape and habitat. They cover water, commercial activity, residential, and recycling. Two of them, landscape and water, extend across the entire area and territory of Grand Synth, making connections to existing landscape and water elements. Um, a large part of the area was surrounded by canal, uh, and there are areas that have been recuperated from the original canal and been redeveloped, so that both these elements, in a sense, are working together to create a connection right across the site. Each of the bands has also been designated and developed with a particular periodicity related to either its, its functions or its elemental traits. The aim in terms of this was to try and develop in relation to each of the bands different rhythms in relation to each other so that some of these, these rhythms occur daily, weekly, monthly, or perhaps <coughs> yearly. The, the banding of functions and activities relates specifically in the commercial um, band, which was positioned in relation to the existing shopping center here, which is at the bottom of the tower block and adjacent to it, which was organized internally so that the new commercial center was, was positioned 
partly in relation to try and develop, consolidate, um, and solidify some of the activities in relation to that, which one of which included a, a, a weekly market that occurred there. Now, although it hasn't been um, <coughs> developed as such, it would be proposed that each of the bands would have very specific material qualities. Um, so, for instance, in relation to the landscaping, it, it would have very, very different conditions um, along it relating quite specifically to its negotiation with, with uh, both uh, adjacent uh, landscaping to the existing uh, housing, the public areas, the edges of that area and the way that they're developed in terms of the motorway, uh, and also the, uh, the existing buildings themselves. And I, I'd hope in relation to, to any elaboration that would occur in relation to these um, uh, material qualities that the points of intersection and crossing which have partly been developed uh, in terms of the programs in relation to of each of these bands would then subsequently be developed uh, materially as well and, and some sort of connection perhaps drawn between them. The, the program as, as given um, by Europan consisted of, of 40 housing units and 20,000, uh, equivalent of 20,000 square feet of commercial space. This would occupy approximately 20% of the site as they have, have designated. So the, the response that I've, I've undertaken to do was partly an attempt to how to almost differentiate that, that territory that was the supposed center, primarily <coughs> by simply trying to increase a density of activity. Some of those activities, again related to the, the periodicity, <coughs> might be very, very small and infrequent. And I don't think that it's something that I could necessarily determine or program entirely. It would really depend upon how this uh, proposal could be enacted upon or negotiated with. The housing element, of the project, I've actually treated it in, in quite a simple and almost dumb way. <coughs> and also through it and through the movement of the line that relates to the housing, which also extends beyond the specific boundary of, of, of the site that we were given, try to develop, um, it's not so much a model, but to develop a way of, 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 of having an elemental line that was, was able to negotiate the different conditions that it might find in terms of the existing buildings. And that's, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, this is May Holman, Julian Lewis. Our project, titled Pavilions in the Woodland, is situated in Malsensen, Germany. <coughs> Mal, with its neighbouring communes, lies between the Ruhr Basin and the rural areas of Munster. The evolution of conurbation has not occurred at a historical centre, but through growth of isolated industrial sites, each with its own housing. The district of Malsensen has as its urban centre a junction that of the Bahnhofstrasse and the Essen to Malsensen to Munster railway line, laid on embankments. From the railway station, there are trains out to all the large conurbations of the Ruhr Basin. The existing generative elements which have informed our scheme are the extensive woodland throughout the Ruhr Basin, the Essen to Malsensen to Munster railway line, the Bahnhofstrasse, which runs through the site, the blockhouse to the west of the railway line, and the large chemical zone. Our proposal analyzes the site that consists of many fragments with, with diverse uses, such as the overloaded car park, the dark railway tunnel, Blockhouse, which used to be an air raid shelter, 
scattered two-storey apartment blocks and a post office. Following the brief given by Europan, put forward under the title At Home in the City, we have tried to understand the problems, not just in terms of housing, but in terms of all the functions of our brief, public and private, and of the setting of an industrial town in a natural framework. Indeed, we have identified the woodland as an important unifying element. At Home in the City is considered in as wide a way as possible and at different scales. <coughs> I think I'm going to have to take pot luck. <laughs> okay, um, this is our scheme. These plans show two levels. Um, it's a bit, it, as I speak, it's obviously difficult to make much sense of it, but this is what we consider to be the woodland kind of datum level. It's the ground. Then there's a raised level, which is the level of the railway, but it's a kind of significant raised level. Um, I'll just point out the, the main elements. There's the, there's the railway, the kind of main railway running through which we you probably didn't pick up in the map. Um, there's the road running underneath it, and there's a kind of... What we've done is widened <coughs> the railway where the road meets the railway. I mean, this is a kind of important, very difficult knot for the site, which, which we had to deal with. There's the, there's the blockhouse, which <coughs> is the air aid shelter which you saw. There's the sports field. Um, and there are two main elements of the scheme. There's what we've called a garden matrix on this side, and there's a park matrix on this side, which is attached to the railway. The first question is, where is Mal Sinsen? We see it seated in a large woodland an industrial town embedded in green. The settlement has emerged generally under the principles of Amos Rappaport's plan, whereby industrial and residential zones are separated by green belts with the facility of green space for recreation after work. The industrial town of Marl has extended east out into a limb, the road and railway bisecting the woodland, which lies densely to the north and south. The road and railway have become the predominant generators for the built configuration, negating the presence of the woodland. So basically what we're saying is that the road and the railway are not deliberate elements. We're trying to make something deliberate. Our aim is to reconnect and rediscover the woodland, making the road and railway serve places within the woodland. Presently the road and railway have an overriding functional presence. The existing functions on the site may be locally defined as two areas the blockhouse here, you can see it, and adjoining fallow land. At the moment, this is a kind of <coughs> plot of, of land which is just not defined by anything. We're hoping this is the bit we can build, actually, because it's the only bit that um, is owned directly by the people of Mal. Um, there are shops and housing at the moment scattered around to the east side of the railway. Um, and we feel that the site has two points of focus, that of the blockhouse, the air raid shelter, and that of the railway station, which is here. At the moment, this is a dark tunnel. We've widened it, and we've extended it out here. In our proposals, the station is given a piazza. This is contained within what we've called the park matrix. The blockhouse becomes the nucleus of a cultural centre. In each case, the areas are defined within a green matrix. So the cultural centre is seen to be contained within a walled garden. So within the matrix, there's a walled 
garden. And the piazza is within a park. I mean, at the moment, this is quite, quite dense woodland, and we've kept this bit, which is particularly dense. This is not so dense as a car park here, but we still consider this to be part of the park, even though it's not so densely green. The matrices loosely gather together different functions which acquire a collective sense of place. Housing is placed as raised pavilions, um, permeated by the same garden as the blockhouse, whilst the third wall to the walled garden is formed within the public and private interactive zone. Just across here, this, is con this building is containing the third wall of the garden, which is across the road here. The road is transcended and subordinated to a secondary element, and interactive zones of activity between different functions and places are emphasised. At the station, the dense retained woodland adjacent to it is linked to the busy piazza by a raised platform. So again, this is the platform. You get out of the train and it, you can actually walk out at a raised level. It's difficult to see it in the model. I mean, here, you're standing looking from the piazza towards the railway. So you're standing there, looking through there to the blockhouse, which is kind of invisible through there. <coughs> This perspective is looking at the side of the blockhouse. You're standing there looking at the side here. Um, there's a glass strip of cafe and shops at ground level here, which you can see extending out. It links the two, the, the, the two parts of the park <coughs> with views into each. This park also transcends the road by continuing across it. So these two areas are seen as green places within the woodland, programmatic matrices, which have nearby precedents such as the industrial town, which is on the map, is the kind of enormous chemical village on the first slide, and the sports field. Um, on these kind of analytical diagrams, there's a, a green sports field here, which is... Well, we're saying that both of them are occurring as programmatic clearings in the woodland. I mean, the, sport, the sports field is green and open, and the um, chemical one is dense and built up, but really what we're saying is that this is trying to extend those and be one of those and make a, a deliber deliberate um, layout. At ground level, then, one perceives a natural woodland mm -hmm. datum level, whereas the raised artificial platforms and pavilions, which kind of are responding to the railway's artificiality, is raised in this. Um, with key viewpoints offers a particular means of relating to each other, provides a built relativity from platform to platform, from platform to matrix and from matrix to woodland. People are able to see each other and see where they are. That's it. Thanks. We just wanted to say a couple of words at the beginning about the way we operate. It's perhaps slightly different to some of the others. Um, the the, the, the main interest that we have is in the um, very rapidly changing urban conditions that uh, I guess the post-industrial city is, is um, forcing onto many parts of, of the globe. And we've been exploring since 1990 a number of um, different locations. And also um, the way the group operates is that it's more interested in the... Um, if you like, the energy between the individuals and what we can get out of that rather than the ego of any particular individual. Um, there are a couple in the Netherlands, well in fact there's three, Dominic and uh, Joe Woodruff, um, and uh, a Canadian who's uh, also been collaborating with us on the, on the most recent project and some of the research that we've been doing, Burton Hanfeld. <laughs> and then there are two from, uh, who are based in New Zealand at the moment, uh, Nick Barrett Boys and <coughs> Stephen McDougall. And then Currently, at the moment, there's uh, myself and Emmanuel Poggi, um, who are operating from here in a rather on-off fashion. But, I mean, all of us work for other firms, if you like, and it's very much a forum rather than a practice. What I want to talk about first is just set the scene of actually these sort of (laughs) 
I thought both were working. Thanks. Right, what we'd like to do is actually just set a scene, the context of what our scheme is, is situated in. This is not the site. Um, what, we're, what, what, what we're finding is that the inadequacy of the medieval city to actually offer us the things that we, we desire in the, in the end of the century. And um, also the representation of that reality, which is also inadequate to describe the sort of spatial and temporal qualities that we, we see around us. Next. This is the reality, um, a sort of disparate elements within a city, the violation of public space with the uh, dissolution of the 19th century sort of infrastructure, leaving very large voids within the city. The dis disenfranchisement of uh, space with the, the advent of the motorway across America and the sort of the suburban quality of each man having his own plot. The, um, the privatisation of public space in Wiltshire Boulevard in LA, where the car park is actually becoming the new forum for public events. And this slide on the right, which is actually not Beirut, but London in January 92, where the idea of such an unseen force, such as a terrorist act, can actually halt and um, very radically change the way the city works. So what is arising is actually something which is a bit more delicate. There is, it's not so much a chaos, but an order which is, is more, more invisible and, and, and intangible, but it's there, and it's very delicate. Next. And the ways in which we, try to ha we, we, we have to start looking at representing these spaces has to change as well, where maybe the idea of time and things like that can actually take place. Next on the left. So what we do is moving really from the idea of the monocentric city with the, the expanded satellites generated around a core to that of the polycentric, the viral infection, the idea that each one contains its own centre and therefore um, sort of describing a series of, of elements and the connections between them become the variables. Other preoccupations we have which are in line with this but um, more of a sort of the phenomenological and conceptual and literal level is the idea of, of, of the line as a connection, boundary, and separator. The idea of the experience of that line, the path, and actually how one experiences the way of actually moving through that line. No, no, the your left hand one needs to go back one. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's working. <laughs> Doesn't want to work. Okay. Right, point it out of the machine. <laughs> Could you actually operate the slides? It's probably easier. Yeah. Yeah, please. I'll, I'll just say next, and then yeah. the idea of the experience of that line, the, the cinematic quality, and actually how one can move through it and across that line. Next, please. And the idea of this sort of this openness, the, the idea of setting up a framework which can actually be appropriated in many different ways. The idea of a fold, not in so many terms as not in, so, in such a sense as Deleuze, but more of the readings of Octavio uh, Paz. Next, please. The idea of process, the sort of alchemical view of, of not so much the result, but the way you move through it and towards it. Um, that is something that we, is, is always is, is, is something that we've studied in all our projects. Next, please. So what we're, we're, we're looking at is this idea, this sort of, this quality where you almost want to fall in, but at the same time you want to sort of step back from it. Um, and they're the interesting things, is this sort of, the sort of qualities that are being described in those previous slides something our project's trying to uh, explore for this vertiginous quality. Next, please. This is, this is the site for the European project. Um, it's in Groningen in the Netherlands. Um, perhaps the, this, the, the key focus that we were interested in, it's worth stating that the, the actual brief for the site was um, a small piece of the red zone that you see up there, the top left hand piece of it, which is 
one and a half hectares and the brief was 100, 180 housing units or housing working units with two supermarkets. Um, we were actually interested in the, the entire city, particularly the ring zone that you can see and uh, more gen well, more specifically the uh, ten and a half hectare red zone that you see on the site. Next please. These slides show, if you like, the, f the first condition that we were dealing with as a, a generator for the project, which was desire lines to try and connect the different conditions of the city, both the, the central context um, of the Renaissance city, if you like, and also the surrounding housing. Um, and then likewise across the ring itself, um, from a, the interstitial zone of, of uh, hospital, uh, semi-industrial and parkland. Next please. These, these slides illustrate uh, those desire lines and the way that they're developed across the site. Um, this I, the idea that we wanted to actually was this, of trying to re-establish this area as a positive element to actually build upon this, the, the sort of positive elements of the marginal qualities of this site and to try and get people to cross through the site so that one didn't try to deny this idea of extending the, the sort of the urban block into this zone or the, the sort of the suburban qualities of the other area and try and create something new which will allow people to actually move through the site and beyond it. So it really becomes a sort of a hinge which is actually their word they use for the brief. But like, likewise, uh, other forms of life as well. So it was working as a, a kind of um, motorway for other species, not just for human beings to get across the site, but particularly with the parkland and then the canal that you can just see leading off the edge of the, the left-hand slide. Next, please. And then this, these two slides just summarise for us, if you like, the, the essence of both the, the, um, the site and its history. There used to be, um, if you like, the site was used for all sorts of um, peripheral activities including the circus and for us that became an attitude for the, for the whole um, way of dealing with this piece of the city that circus living um, offered a, a, a very um, dense combination of hybrid activities that could be used on the site. Next. Uh, these, th this next series of four um, sets of slides just show the main generators for the way that we dealt with that general issue of circus living. The first one is movement through the site. Next. The next one, which is the, the key ingredient following, if you like, desire lines through this um, filter that we try to develop um, between these different existing conditions of the city, were the attractors which are the, the main ingredients, including the two supermarkets, the top and bottom, and a couple of existing buildings that we suggested other uses for. Next. Uh, and then the idea of condensers, which were elements that were within um, various blocks to house the ingredients that were asked for and a whole series of others uh, that we looked at suggesting, which were places that um, if you like, were the ability to live in a place and um, connect into a, a whole range of other activities, particularly social ingredients. Um, internet. Yeah, the idea of internet, facts. I mean, that you could live and work in this place and plug into each one of these um, local uh, centres within each living block. Next, please. And then the idea of um, a working landscape, the idea of mediators between these various blocks, that the landscape became um, a very positive element in the way that it was mediating between the various living situations. Um, and, and likewise, the blocks themselves became mediators between <coughs> these landscapes. What, what happened was we actually tried to, again, sort of not fall into the trap of creating some sort of tapis vert where we, you know, sort of block standing in a green park. But the, the landscape elements became figure as well. So there's no figure and ground. We try to sort of destroy that relationship. There's a figure and figure. So the, the, the gardens were constructed as much as the buildings. And spatially, they were trying to achieve as much and as ambitious enough as the buildings themselves. 
And these were the transitional elements moving from public to private space. The, the other thing that's worth saying too is that, is that um, the, um, the, the, the idea of, of the interaction between these things was, was to... Um, I've lost my train of thought now. <laughs> um, next. Yeah, next. <laughs> And well, uh, yeah, the the, the the larger environmental issues that these uh, two slides are focusing on, which um, mediated, if you like, between the different types of environments that you could use, both within the blocks and the landscape, so that there was a, a rich connection between the two. Next, next. And then these two slides <coughs> show. The, um, the larger context of, of the site and the proposal within that um, <coughs> and a whole series of, of weaving blocks that are attempting uh, to avoid both conditions of the historic city and also the more recent uh, 19th century housing. So they're not closed courtyard blocks and they're not, um, if you like, the more recent modern condition of, of um, isolated bar blocks. There's something in between, and the um, conditions, if you like, on, on the ground surface as well, is something in between. So it's, it's searching for ways forward to develop and enrich the qualities that actually exist on the site at the moment. <coughs> Can I add anything to that? No. Next. Next. So what you have is a series of seemingly randomly placed ele uh, building elements within the site, and yet they were specifically placed in line with um, aspects of orientation, the way one moved through the site, and actually how one perceived the site from actually on the outside perimeter of the old urban block, um, the way the wind moved through it, and the way that light caught buildings at certain times. So it's sort of also the way that actually the incrementally the buildings could actually be built. And that landscape that we've, we've talked about before was not only something that worked in plan, but actually started to, to move and interweave within the blocks themselves. So this sort of semi-public, or the, the attitude that the enrichment of a semi-public space could actually sort of weave itself through the buildings, up through the facade, and actually into pockets within the buildings themselves. And they became sort of semi-communal spaces within the buildings that could be used by the inhabitants. Next, please. And these are some of the qualities that we're looking at, the idea of, of program, of actually activating these spaces, of actually what happens when you, 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 you contain space or let it bleed, and the, the idea of actually angling the buildings for sun and wind. Next. The qualities of, of private or public space, and the, you know, the, these mediating gardens would actually have some of these qualities. Next. Then the, the actual blocks themselves and the way that that was developed, I mean, we were interested in the idea of um, a winter garden typology that was uh, very flexible in both uh, the types of uses that it could be um, uh, appropriated by, both in terms of living, in terms of um, workspaces, in terms of office spaces and so on, um, but also in how that could be used um, quite efficiently and from an environmental point of view. And the third thing was that to try and manipulate these blocks um, as, a, as a kind of Rubik's Cube, that, that you could uh, move these things into different configurations um, and, <laughs> and have, have the ability of, of using them in quite different ways so, so that they became very flexible regardless of their orientation. I mean, what you, what you could have is you, so the, what you have is you have patio houses, you have double height um, duplexes, you have studios, and one can actually start to choose what finishes they have, et cetera, et cetera. So the autonomy of the grid, or the autonomy of the nature of the structure is actually broken down by the individual use and appropriation of their in sort of the home. Next, please. And the idea of this sort of central idea of the winter garden where one can actually move throughout the year and appropriate that space in different ways. Um, the image on the left showing the sort of this space and how one can actually, this space can be actually appropriated by one of the functions already in the house, or it become an outside space, or actually contain its own space. Um, 
or it becomes a studio or a workshop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Next, please. And the idea of that sort of condensed landscape, which the facade becomes as a filter environmentally and also visually to the outside world. Next, please. Next. Next. So, I mean, this was try we, we try to sum, it, sum our, our thoughts up in, in two images. Um, this is a poem by Malamé and uh, in Coup de Day. And what it does, it, it, th there's a structure there. And I think what's important for us is that we're trying to create a framework. Um, we deny the idea of the blueprint of the, of the, uh, the absolute. And what we try to set up is, is a series of very simple rules which can actually be changed and move incrementally through the idea of process. And what this in the poem, what happens is that there's a series of, of statements or lines, and, and it can read as a poem, but one can actually move through that poem in any way he chooses. There are many ways. It is, it's, to a certain extent, it is, it is open as a structure. And what becomes more important is also is the space between those words are actually just as important as the words themselves. So it's actually a spatial poem. Thank you. So do you point without when you're doing this doing the thing? Um, well, I want to introduce us. I'm Sarah Wigglesworth, and this is Jeremy Till, and we did um, this competition together. We've never worked on a competition together before. Um, I want to introduce a project that we worked on, which is, was in uh, Stockholm in Sweden, by um, talking a little bit about the, the site, because that um, formed the basis of our interpretation for this, this, um, this entry. Um, this, this map here shows um, the relationship of our site to central Stockholm, which is um, uh, the area in which the site was located. Um, this is the Gamla Stan, it's the island on which central Stockholm is situated. And this region and this region are the 19th century, uh, 18th and 19th century additions to central Stockholm. Um, this is our site here in Hergesten, which is one of a number of uh, 20th century suburbs which were built um, in the surrounding areas um, around these central islands. And um, Stockholm is essentially, uh, essentially consists of a series of these suburban centres. And in this case, Hergeston is um, located on this suburban railway line, which goes from the centre of Stockholm outwards. And these are s a series of other um, suburban centres that, that link it back to the centre. Um, the characteristics of Stockholm are that it is, is all situated around water, as you can see. This is um, the sea and the inland lake. Um, and the characteristic topography is that it's extremely um, undulating and it's characterized by huge granite outcrops which um, emerge from the center, fr from, from the kind of surface um, of the landscape. Um, giving it a really kind of wild feel and that happens all around whether it's <coughs> in the centre of the city or further towards the, the suburbs and, and the outskirts. This then is our site, it's a right line here, and you can't actually see the sea from the site. The things which kind of define it, it's sort of no man's land, which is why it's never been built in like this, because it doesn't have any sort of characteristics which you can draw on. Down here, there's a sort of um, 19th century, uh, quite sort of complacent and Victorian, happy town centre with terraced houses. Um, next in the chronology is this piece here, which is extends the miles, which is sort of typical uh, Stockholm suburbia, little log cabins set in log forests and a sort of ideal existence. I mean, it's true suburbia in Stockholm. I mean, Chislehurst has nothing on this sort of thing. And then the last sort of thing is the 70s um, slab blocks, which comes through it and surround the site as well. And what's quite interesting is the way that each of these conditions sort of reflect the changing paradigms of what sort of living might be. 
um, and particularly frowned in. But the site which the brief we were given is simply for housing, it's just housing, it doesn't have anything else in it. And housing for elderly, and also they stress the thing that the sort of um, demographic trends show that uh, I think 40% of people in Stockholm are single and 30% are over 65. So all these kind of ideals are somewhat um, to be questioned. And the scheme, the, the brief was incredibly sensible, and I think our scheme is really sensible too. I mean, it's sort of one of these things where when you're doing competitions, you, you kind of either do them, ideally you do them over the polemic edge and to win them. This one we did to win. Uh, and so we sort of followed the very, very sensible guidelines which were given us. I'm not trying to make excuses because it's sort of, the trouble is we, you get a double whammy because when you lose and you don't have the planet edge as well, you sort of do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not trying to make an excuse, but I'm just kind of putting it in Sounds context. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Give it here. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, back to this for a second. This is our site, outlined in green. It's a steeply so sloping site. This is the suburban railway running along here and this great big road which was built and then terminated with the sheltered housing here, uh, which they wanted to do something with. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it rises 15 metres between this point here and this point here. So that gives you some clue. This is a um, <coughs> photograph of the site at its best in the middle of winter. And really, um, the, the kind of key characteristics about it which we got uh, quite interested in were, were kind of twofold. The first was the fact that um, the, the ground itself um, really exhibits kind of these paradigmatic conditions of the, of the Stockholm landscape, which is that it's, it's a, w a kind of a wilderness. It's not really looked after by anybody. And it really exemplifies um, a condition that exists in Sweden, which is to do with the ownership and possession of land, which we found extremely interesting given the way in which land is configured in this country, uh, where uh, prior to the Reform Act, you were not allowed to vote unless you owned land. In Sweden, they have um, written into their constitution a right called the Alamans Ret, which is it, it means in English every man's right and what it, what it signifies is that you are able to go on any piece of ground anywhere in Sweden with impunity and so the idea uh, really kind of forged in our mind that uh, this, this kind of exemplified this condition that in fact it was public property that everybody owned it that you could uh, trespass anywhere effectively um, and that to, to tramp it was in effect to own it. And so um, we wanted to <coughs> work with the idea that um, the land was open and accessible to everybody. And that, in a sense, uh, leads me to the second point, which was to do with the fact that the site um, contains these enormous slab blocks on, on basically the top of the hill. Um, and they form a really key element of the, of the actual kind of natural landscape, if you like. Um, it, and they possess it in, in a kind of quasi-modernist fashion because uh, they, they, they kind of touch it in a way as an object in the landscape, just as the rocks are like outcrops there as well. So, um, in a sense, the two are working uh, perhaps in parallel. And I think it's important also that the kind of... Um we're not trying to privilege one thing over the other, not to say the wilderness is kind of authentic and the modernness is artificial, because I think that both are kind of constructs. And so our scheme sort of picks it up in this first study, which um, shows the blue is the sort of this untamed landscape which comes up and over the hill. We put a block um, which never, never touches it, um, through there, which also forms a sort of uh, a threshold between the site and the 19th century bit down there. These are the sort of the landscape. And then across the top of the site, there's this, um, we set a wall, which is like the top of the citadel, which forms a date in which the tower blocks can then sit on, and also slightly divide two types of landscape. The centre then is left completely open to sort of pursue this idea of every man's land. Um, 
it's not a park as such, because I don't think a park is accessible in the same way that the Swedish constitution would like it to be seen. I mean, that is, it's actually kind of has a set of boundaries and rules. And it's meant to be this kind of, I suppose, dedicated <coughs> space. And then there's, the scheme basically just works around the periphery with a series of fragments around the periphery, which kind of respond to the suburb there, the sort of town centre down here, the threshold there. Okay, so this is a model really um, illustrating how we develop that idea. And um, um, although this vertical scale is exaggerated, I think it um, reveals quite clearly what we were, are about here. So effectively, um, this pier block um, and these walls here are situated as um, elements in kind of uh, opposition to the uh, contours of the site. Um, and here's the citadel wall which effectively forms a kind of datum or base on which then these uh, slab blocks um, sit. Um, uh, this, this becomes a kind of platform which terminates the vista up this, up this road and uh, links through to the um, sheltered housing. Um, and then these blocks are kind of mediating elements which uh, both hug the wall but also form like a uh, touch the ground very, very lightly, like uh, modernist buildings. And this is sort of, this is the uh, sensible plan of it. With the, uh, I mean, the, the, the scheme it puts on you know, um, the housing is very simple in terms of its uh, elderly and single persons have the housing mainly with mixed use up there. And as I said, we're kind of working around the periphery and not establishing just leaving the centre to go. We're just kind of little remnants of a sort of a fragment of a town square there, a fragment of a gateway there, um, responding to each of those conditions. And what, what this slide really um, shows, it, to me anyway, is uh, the idea that actually what you're dealing with here is kind of... the that the elements that uh, we configure on the site, as well as those that are already existing, are in a sense the, p the same kind of thing. In other words, what, what we're doing is, um, re I suppose, taking the, uh, using the, our, um, our interventions as kind of points of reference, if you like, that um, reconfigure certain characteristics that already exist on the site, so that uh, the, the, the slab block here, which is raised on Pilotti, forms a kind of a threshold um, as you move up this greensward, just as this platform here forms a termination to the vista. Um, and then, so that each of these elements work a bit like trees or rocks in their own right as they would exist on the site. And in a sense, um, perhaps they all become part of the same thing. They're not distinguishable as building or landscape. So. The architects, uh, I, what I'd like to do now is I'm going to ask, I think I'm going to ask um, Alejandro first to uh, make some uh, general comments about uh, the projects seen this evening and then leave, leave Jeff until second so that he can at least be forced to sit here for <laughs> 10 minutes no, no, or so. No, I'm not going anywhere. I, I actually don't know if I can uh, focus in 10 minutes a serious critique of each one of these projects, especially because they are also uh, made from a uh, very different uh, perspectives or standpoints. Uh, so basically I'm gonna use this uh, opportunity that you gave me to uh, propose a question that I think is uh, related to the, first of all, to the title that you gave to this uh, uh, presentation uh, and also I think in general terms with the issue of Europe as a, as a frame uh, to operate. And it is an issue that uh, uh, interests me a lot, uh, almost uh, uh, because it almost affects me on a, on a personal 
level, which is uh, <coughs> the fact that European is a competition that that is uh, that uh, settles a, a frame that is not useful in the uh, traditional um, architectural practice, which is the fact that architects are uh, forced to operate somewhere else. Or actually, they are not forced because, uh, and that uh, is something that. Uh, it's also biographically because I entered this competition. I don't know if you knew. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't invite me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, but it, it is uh, a reflection that actually comes from the fact that I entered this competition in a in a very different way to the to the one uh, everybody else uh, who presented today did. Uh, I entered the competition with uh, Rashid, who is uh, my partner, uh, in a site that we knew extremely well because we almost had to do a project in uh, in the area. Uh, so I knew extremely well the, the conditions, uh, the orders that were operating on uh, economic, political, uh, architectural level at the at the side and we we didn't win anything and then we heard that uh, actually the uh, english had an, an extreme success in this uh, in this uh, session of uh, europe uh, and uh, when you invited me and, and i started thinking what what general reflection can i make on the on on the europe and i i thought that it was worth to mention that uh, maybe the reason for the English success was the fact that uh, they or all were forced to operate somewhere else. Because <laughs> 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 so, in, uh, uh, I think that is that is uh, something to be uh, taken into into account. Uh, and also, uh, I think it, it was a, a deep mistake from our part to uh, do the competition in a side that that uh, we knew. Uh, so uh, that uh, uh, poses the, the question whether you become more or less, uh, whether actually the fact that you have to operate somewhere else uh, gives you a certain power to operate a, a kind of brutality uh, because of, of the uh, lack of uh, knowledge of the, of the real conditions that makes you more powerful uh, than uh, the people who actually know this, these conditions. That is uh, something that is uh, being possible to maybe uh, practice on a more systematic way uh, today because uh, it's uh, becoming increasingly easier for uh, every architect to, to move uh, from... Uh, and that, that is a new, new condition that I think is, uh, we, we have to to reflect uh, on. Uh, my personal uh, perspective on that uh, fact is that actually this uh, brutality is uh, sometimes uh, <coughs> positive. So I, I would even suggest that the, the title that you gave, which is A Topos, mm -hmm. is substituted by something like Hyper Topos. Precisely because of this uh, this condition, I don't think the fact that you are forced to um, operate uh, without knowing uh, strictly all the orders uh, at uh, operating at the site is necessarily an an advantage to uh, uh, to operate as an architect. And uh, that, uh, to some extent, uh, what uh, that possibility suggests is uh, uh, the potential for the type of operation that uh, uh, rather than uh, creating homo homogeneities, which is maybe what uh, was proposed uh, in other periods of time, the, the international style, etc., etc., uh, uh, produces a kind of uh, artificial uh, uh, extreme development of the of the site maybe in a in a direction that doesn't necessarily follow the the local conditions 
so uh, the creation of some kind of locality that is uh, not necessarily determined by uh, the existing uh, orders, by the local orders. And uh, well, basically that is the the question that I would I would uh, pose to the maybe to the competitors to to ask whether that uh, was uh, an interesting condition to uh, operate within and in what sense uh, did it uh, happen I think there are there are uh, <coughs> if I make a, a kind of Com uh, comment on the proposals that were presented. I, I would say there were uh, there are two uh, maybe uh, extremes in the in the positions that we uh, that were presented today. One was probably done operating from a, a kind of uh, uh, a local, uh, or at least that's the way I understand it. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Almost, uh, in, not, I wouldn't say. I would say that maybe the, the geometries or the orders that you are trying to apply to the site don't are not produced uh, at all, or not deduced at all by the existing uh, conditions, and only uh, related a posteriori. Uh, and maybe the other option, the other uh, extreme, would be probably Peter who uh, made a very Which rigorous team? Peter Beard and uh, his partner, I don't remember, Beard. Mark, Mark, Mark yeah. Beard. Uh, where the, the position is almost the, the opposite. Uh, and I, I would like to maybe propose a, a more uh, mediated position that uh, didn't, didn't lose the intensity of these two proposals, because I think as much as in the other proposals it's less uh, clear to me the position of the authors in respect to this uh, condition, these two proposals have a, a, uh, an extreme uh, tension that I uh, appreciate, or a higher tension than, than, than maybe uh, other entries. So... Are you going to make it? Um, <coughs> a couple of short preliminary remarks. Uh, I too wanted to enter the competition, but I found out uh, you had to be under 15 or something. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, there was real age discrimination. Should be encouraged. Second thing I'd like to tell you is uh, all day long I've been looking at student projects, 15 of them, and. Uh, so I looked at seven projects tonight, and it was an incredible relief, regardless of what my value judgments were, to find a correlation between what was said and what you saw on the project. Uh, so I appreciated that from all of the entries. <laughs> I knew it was possible. I was beginning to wonder if it had gone away. But, uh, so. um, I thought the schemes were... There, there are several points that I thought came out of watching the schemes that I think might be interesting to raise. Um, there are a wide variety of sites and a very wide variety of strategies, but no particular correlation between the differences in the sites and the differences in the strategies. So a lot of strategies were tried, um, but very little interest in the differences. I, I understand one didn't do a compet the competition in terms of the difference between that site and another site, but it's surprising to find at least uh, six or six or seven different strategies and six or seven different sites and not find a strong and compelling um, correlation between this particular site and the uh, strategy. So what we see, what we saw tonight is um, uh, explorations of different strategies that are not yet thought uh, in, or, or maybe are slowly detaching themselves from considerations of the place. Um, and I think I'll go into that in a second more as I look at each or discuss the specific schemes briefly. Um, the other thing was generally the ambitions of the project I thought divided. Um, there were two projects that I thought were basically reparative. Um, Peter Beard's and Mark, Mark Brearley's scheme essentially were looking at what they considered to be a condition that needed repair. Um, there was the particular 
attention to, I thought, what Peter Beard Mark really called um, something like deep bland, blandness in the sense of void in what was the product of the previous generation's building and Mayhem and Julian Lewis's uh, um, sense that the resulting urban fabric that they were dealing with, I believe it was in Malson Sen, uh, was um, accidental and not deliberate and that uh, they would go in and, and there was a kind of reparation. Yeah. That made me think about something. It made me, what would, what would, um, eat, what would it, what would we do if the previous generation had gotten it right? Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it would be a terrible thing for architect if, uh, architecture of previous generation ever got it right. And that has, that has two consequences. It means no one ever has lived in something that they should have lived in. Um, which, I <laughs> which I'm not sure is quite right. Um, and for these reasons, I was very interested in these two projects, but I preferred the projects, um, the, at least the situation of the project by um, Dominique and Chris in the Studio 333, and in, in an ironic sense by Peter um, Davidson, and that was not so much a discussion of what was wrong in the existing conditions or what was missing from the existing conditions um, and therefore what should be restored, but a sense the in inadequacy of the existing conditions to satisfy the new kinds of desires and new kinds of spatial organizations and living patterns that uh, changing, life, changing conditions in life um, might require or look for. And so several of the projects I, I thought were not so much in the reparative mode as in the projective mode. Um, and as I said, Studio 333, Don based. Now Don was very clever, I think. And that is, <coughs> he wanted to make sure that everyone got his projects. So he showed his project and then he showed a, another project which was a bad version of his project. So his project looked really good. <laughs> <laughs> Because essentially both of them <laughs> used strategies to aggregate what appeared to be neo-medieval um, labyrinthine urban scapes, but Don did cut the crystal lines through it, which essentially gave it its new polemic edge, and uh, um, Ken didn't do that. And so, <laughs> so one got your project, and it was very smart of you to set it off against the, uh, the other. Um, I don't see how Studio 333's project could possibly have lost. I mean, they had everything going. They had, uh, it was a green project, it was a flexible project, it was new and bold and young. And <laughs> <laughs> it had attractors and condensers and mediators, uh, had desire. There's I mean, five Pardon me? There's five Yeah, I just uh, thought, did it win or did it help? Yeah. See, I mean, this is a no-lose project. Uh, but what was interesting about, uh, the, the one project I thought was odd, slightly odd, <laughs> although presented in such a way as to make the oddness of it not odd anymore, was uh, the Wigglesworth and Tile project. Is, and that, it, that was, um, it, was, it seemed very agnostic to me. It seemed um, that you looked at the organization of form and space and the particular conditions and then you looked to reiterate that. And, and I thought, uh, it was neither reparative nor projective, um, and therefore I called it agnostic. But at the same time, it was presented as, a, in a very interesting way, as being um, reasonable, as opposed to having a polemic edge. And then I wondered, what happened to the good old days when being reasonable was a polemic edge? So, I mean, I thought, I thought the project, um, uh, left me wondering, even how it was reasonable. But I guess in the end, as I looked look at all the projects, one of the things that I thought that, that all, all the projects probably should be responsible to answer to in some sense is the commonality of the analysis. Um, whatever the projective goals or reparative goals, certain principles, organizational principles on the site, uh, functional principles on the site, where everybody said where the 19th century building was, uh, what the, <laughs> so we all know, you know we all, there's always a drawing showing the closest 19th century building. Um, uh, that, and that's interesting because essentially it's the key features of the site, major organizational conditions, and then you situate your work against it. Um, even uh, the project that I was most attracted to, which is uh, Peter Davison's project, did that. 
Um, although the projective projects did that so as to set off um, their, let's say, new claims. The projected projects, I'm sorry, I'm wandering a little bit, may have the assumption that the, the received catalog of um, organizational patterns and building types is perhaps no longer uh, capable of satisfying uh, desires. And so they're, they're looking to uh, project possible, satis po possible strategies of satisfaction. Um, but, the, but, but this commonality of analysis um, was surprising, and I, I think in the end it's why the projects were not able to make claims about the effects that they produced because the analysis <coughs> of the input, um, so to, once you've identified the, the pattern, the existing pattern, the key buildings and the infrastructure, then all you can say is I've obeyed that or disobeyed that. You don't actually say, in disobeying that, I produce this alternative uh, condition. Although, I say Peter, I think Peter Davidson, and to some extent, Studio 333 did that. Um, an analysis might go something, we heard some suggestion of it. If, for example, um, I mean, I, I was just thinking at the top of my head. Some of these cities, if, if some of these cities, most of the people had faxes, most of the people traveled, most of the people watched TV, uh, that would be a different situation. So Dunkirk may or may not be like um, uh, Mal Saint Saint or, or uh, Hagerston. I mean, these, we don't know to what extent these cities are like one another simply by using the same analysis to examine their similarities and differences because the analysis that was used comes out of a way of approaching an architectural problem from a specific point of view. And so it's unlikely that a similar analysis from a different pol polemic position will give you a, an adequate insight to the project so that you can engage in a projective or um, reparative strategy. So I, I guess those are my comments. I mean, I, the other thing is, I think it's not, one should not take a short comment as being an adequate situation or discussion of the projects. In fact, before we started, I wanted to discuss each project separately, which clearly would have taken too much time. So just out of respect for the work that I thought was quite interesting to see, I don't want you to think the short remarks were in any sense meant to be an adequate discussion of the work. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I was, I was uh, struck by um, the it seemed to me that there were kind of like three broad divisions, which seemed uh, almost surprising to me and paradoxical, which is that there were, appeared to be uh, a um, fantasy about a kind of carnivalesque medieval life that informed the um, uh, a, a view of civicness and a view of living, of being at home in the city, which was after all the theme of the competition, which infused um, uh, a large number of the projects seen tonight, and I think particularly, um, that I, I would actually take issue with Alejandro about um, Don's because it seemed to me that rather than uh, not emerging out of the site, uh, not emerge uh, uh, and being somehow a posteriori uh, in, in its relation to the re relation of the reasoning to the site, it seemed to me rather that it grew explicitly out of um, a kind of almost medievalism. Um, fantasy about civic life. Um, <clears throat> and the, 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 the surprising projects for me were those um, like uh, Jeremy Mitchell, Sarah Wigglesworth, and uh, Peter Beer and Mark Brillies, which, which um, took uh, a quite radical view against that. Maybe it's something, maybe there, there is actually a, 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 a relation to sightedness and, and the immediate context which is being played out somehow. But um, <clears throat> the surprise for me was that where I had kind of, uh, in a way, prejudged this uh, uh, almost arbitrarily selected group of people <clears throat> into those that would have some belief in, in placemaking and those that might not, um, it's, as the evening uh, uh, moved on, I found that my assumptions about that had actually been radically overturned and that there was <coughs> a paradox which was that those strategies which were to do with, with um, uh, kind of grafting, shifting uh, arrangements of, uh, of, of 
Um, lines brought from uh, apparently outside the site appeared to have much more to do with a fantasy about placemaking, which was uh, historical and um, very much to do with civicness, and that those projects which came from people who I imagined would be much more, and in the pres presentations talked a lot about the earth and the ground and the kind of woodcutter-like fantasies, um, actually had much less to do with um, ideas about place. So it was a kind of, for me, there was a, uh, uh, actually a, dis <coughs> a kind of disjunction between the words uh, used and the projects made, which, um, which I found uh, compelling. It was, as if, it was as if my expectations had been turned on their head, that those people who were, who, who were doing one thing were actually doing the other, and uh, vice versa. Um, <clears throat> after that kind of, kind of general remark, I'd quite like to uh, see whether any of the um, uh, architectural teams who presented their work would like to kind of fill in uh, anything that they feel now that they uh, 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 would have preferred to have underlined. Uh, I know it's difficult in such a short compass to, um, to uh, say everything that you want to say. So um, I'd like to turn discussion over to, uh, to, to you and to other people in the audience. That's like, any questions? If there are none, we'll go home. Um, <laughs> well, give them a minute. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to ask you a question, actually. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but we can do this later. I mean, I'm, uh, Peter Beer. Can I just make a comment? Sure. I mean, in terms of uh, the, the comment you make, I think it it's, I, I would pretty much agree that, that, that actually I think all of the projects have a certain form of fitting in with the site. Mm. The difference is that the, they're different sites. Mm. I mean, some are 17th, 18th, 19th, <coughs> early 20th century. And that, that I think all of them produce an attitude of accommodation. Mm. To you the mean site. to the site, really? But, but I think yeah. I think that's really that's a difficult argument to make. It's, it's, it's quite strange. I mean, a few, even a few, even just a few years ago, it would not. It was not. Um, it was not difficult for OMA, for instance, in the Hague Town Hall to do something which was <coughs> quite other than the site in its in its relation, not to try to make any kind of site-like relations to the context, not to make these kind of mediated, accommodating kind of gestures. Um, and I think that e e even in um, uh, Studio 333 scheme, which appeared, which grew out of, a, of, of, of this carnivalesque understanding of, of the city and chance operations and, and that relation to back to uh, presumably surrealist and situationist practice, some of the references to, to poetry, uh, um, and um, a kind of uh, derive like formulation in terms of how people move through that part of the city that, 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 that they that, it, that it's accommodating and it's actually um, in its relation to situationist practice kind of counter modern um, and uh, almost in a way a um, a kind of playing out of paradoxically of neoconservative themes about city life. Um, and that, that would not, I think two decades, three or four decades ago, that, that would not have occurred. There might have been a much more uh, explicit kind of radical erasure and replacement type strategy employed. And that's not something that we've seen any evidence at all of tonight. And I think that that is really quite kind of, for me that's quite telling that there is always this will, uh, which Alejandro may be right, that sometimes these, these moves are aggressive and that they are informed m more by a lack of information about the site than, than, than knowledge, but that they are still based on um, strategies of accommodation, inflection, mediation, whatever you want to call it. And I think that that, <coughs> that for me was uh, quite impressive about the, the entries. Does that make sense to you? No. No. <laughs> what do you think, sir? Well, I mean, you know, the, the you know, to not be modernist doesn't mean to be neoconservative. Hmm. I think that the, the what would now be affiliated to neoconservatism is a suburban 
notion to strive for a certain kind of urban densification is not the same as a return to romantic 19th century cities. It's actually, you know, potentially, uh, you know, pre, pre, and, pre and 13th century. 13th, 13th, 14th yeah, century. Yeah, but 13th century cities were great. They weren't yeah. neoconservative. I would certainly, I, I would be glad to be labeled as medievalist. That would be all right. Well, you were definitely one of them, so. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. That's, that's okay. But I don't think that, that because it's not this time or the last time, that means that it automatically has a political hmm. designation. Hmm. Right. But, 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 I, but um, if I continue right. that particular sure. line, I mean, I think that, that, for instance, Peter Beard and Mark really could, could have, but chose not to, made some kind of, of uh, um, high density, what used to be called high density, low rise kind of adjunct to those large blocks, which would have, in some way, uh, uh, in relation to strategies that have been employed in Britain, for instance, and in other parts of Europe, made a kind of uh, medieval city like fabric around the big blocks, and they chose not to. No, instead what they did was took commonly held property, divided it up into newly privatized lots, gave it back to the people for agrarian practices. Hmm. What could be more medieval than that? I mean, you know, just because the, pro the massing doesn't look medieval, yeah. the, the spatial strategy was extremely retrograde, and, and you know, I mean, it's not that it's called for them to acknowledge that. I mean, they, they've actually were quite conspicuous, were quite um, direct in saying that that was the assertion of the project. Um, but if what you mean by medieval is constantly that the massing looks like Siena or something, you know, well, that's not medieval, but uh, if the massing looks like a cloistered labyrinth uh, mm -hmm. that's uh, aggregate in its formations, then, then perhaps you're right. But I think uh, if you look at the consequences to a special patterns in Don's scheme, uh, Peter Beard and Mark Brearley's scheme, it's much more, I mean, in fact, they discuss ancient earthworks and uh, mm -hmm. offerings to the city, offerings back through pr these kinds of semi-privatizations, and they're careful not to make, call them privatizations, but uh, reallotting and differentiation of the publicly held zones. I mean, that's actually much more um, uh, a step a, a recuperative step by regaining something that was lost in what they considered to be the destitution of the site by modernism. So I think you also have to be very careful that it's not that it's not just the massing but the policy. I mean, one of the well, I, I, I just to respond. I mean, we did consciously place a series of those, a whole series of those sort of spaces on top of uh, two stories of car parking, which mm. were, you know, they would be, uh, you know, very much perceivable. In that situation. I mean, well, I think it's a, it's and you were careful to use the dirt from the car park to, I mean, you know, I mean, it's not a criticism of, I mean, I think, I think the project is open to criticism, but I think you have to be careful simply not to say that your scheme doesn't engage in uh, ancient practices <laughs> because the buildings don't look ancient. I'm, I'm merely trying to make the point that, that we actually are setting up I think if you I go out to... Uh, I don't think I can accept that that, that overlaying of different models is retrograde. retrograde. No, they, they, they say, I mean, uh, I, it's retrograde in the sense that the land was at one time privately held. It was part of public policy to take privately held land and make it publicly held. And so it was deprivatized as part of the production of that common space. And then they had the they had the idea that it gets much more 
texture and structure if it's given back over to some kind of direct personal intervention. I, I'm, this is not a criticism of the scheme. I think you just have to identify. But I do, I, if you want to hear some criticism of the scheme. The simultaneity of those two things, I think, is, is quite. You mean the simultaneity of the land on top of the parking lot? No, no, of a fine grain infiltrating a much coarser grain of a previous kind of utopian model. And I, I think that's a sort of contemporary concern. And I think, I think it's a, I do too. I think it would have been very interesting to see actually how the land was used. I mean, it's very easy to take a few photographs to, to show it as um, deeply bland and sense of void. I think it's possible to go out to Blackheath, for example, and photograph it as Commons land, which is therefore ne has been is so <coughs> denatured of any personal or any uh, per human life that has become common to the point of being deeply land and void and I think what happens is if you look at it over a period of time it's used just like all commons land is used and deeply differentiated use by in large numbers of people in different ways and different times it's I, I I'm just saying you have to be careful to say that the best way to add texture uh, I'm, I'm not I don't have any problem with the strategy of adding texture I have problems with identifying this deep blandness and sense of void as being a consequence of it being commons, uh, commons property. I'm not saying it's the best way of doing it, but I think that this idea of overlaying different things and that they can exist at the same time. I mean, I don't think that whether something is medievalist or not is as important as whether it's uniformly medievalist, which I found the Don Bates scheme to sort of be. And it was kind of strange. Except for the big glass X. It, Pardon? Except for the big glass X. It was the yeah, second okay. scheme that was yeah, uniformly. Was really no, I agree completely. It was really complex and, and spatially very, very uniform. And, and Except there for were the big some glass. schemes where there was an attempt to overlay different sorts and different sort of different vintages of space. And, and I, I think that's kind of a very, potentially a very fruitful area of investigation. It's one that obviously I'm interested in. Um, and so I, I kind of don't think that the particular morphology that comes out of the scheme is as important as, as what it's being put against or next to. You know, and that's why I found, say, the Studio 333 went very unconvincing, because they, they profess to be you know, interested in event and chance and things like that. But I found it to be actually one of the most deterministic schemes. I found it to be kind of overwhelmingly determined in the way it was drawn. Certainly. Um, and when you looked at it, it was highly, highly determined. There were all these different bits, and I found it very unstrategic at the end of the day. I don't know how you could move anything. I'm sure you could, if you looked in great detail, move things around it, but it was highly, highly determined. Dominic, do you want to answer that? Um, I think what you have to identify is that we've always tried to. Um, move away, people always want to know what the buildings look like. Um, and that's something we've always tried to sort of deny answering the question in that sense. I mean, for us, the most important thing was a strategy of densification of a sort of a, a non-physical densification of the building. Of a series of um, attracting programs that could actually be fused into that site to bring people up and move through that site. That, that's, the only, that's the only thing really that we place no, I know you, you said that, but I mean, the, the, and yet, your the, the scheme, the I would suggest that your scheme was the most specifically drawn. <laughs> I'm not, what is the contradiction is between trying to achieve, achieve a flexible <laughs> effect? I mean, every, high-rise building in New York City is overwrought and it's being drawn and every one of them has tenant occupancy derived 20,000 square foot blank floor plates. There is no conflict between deterministic drawing and trying to achieve flexibility in the effect in the consequences of the project on the site. Now this is not a defense of them but there but it, what it is is a attack on your argument that the fact that it's deterministically drawn makes it necessarily inflexible in its result which is just not true. Well, I didn't, I didn't That's exactly what you said. And it therefore so follows that there is no relationship between the graphic technique and the, the flexibility in the project. I was being more Endlessly, I would say. Very specific. 
Uh, I, I agree with you. It doesn't matter. You can draw something specific, and it can be specifically about astronomy. Well, okay. Just, I'm ask you, I mean, specifically, uh, what, <laughs> when you say things were drawn, what do you, what do you actually identify? Well, there was that, I mean, if you showed some very sort of generic sorts of houses, and that sort of looks strategic, for instance, I mean, I only saw things on the screen very quickly, but then, there seems to me that they're actually, the way you place the building and the landscape, um, place. There wasn't actually room for anything to move around. It seemed highly <coughs> sort of everything was in place. Everything was very much held in a place. I just found there was a bit of a paradox there. I might be completely wrong. I mean, it might be how I was reading the drawing. <coughs> to anybody else? Anyone? Well, I thought this thing about um, that you mentioned about um, knowing the place or not knowing the place, and then, and then, what you engage with in the place, and in most of them, not knowing the place, what you engage with, whether you engage with the place physically, primarily, or you engage with issues that you understand to be there, or this repair of the issues. I think that was, that's very interesting, and I think the way we now see. For example, uh, I think responding to that reparative point struck me as interesting that there was one sense, yes, about the use of land where it was reparative, but there was another sense in responding to the place of acknowledging that there was something positive in how it, how it already is, in this basic spatial structure above and beyond how the land was used, and saying that that didn't need so it was not the same issue of needing repair. So there wasn't, wasn't a sort of flat, I don't think that's a sort of correct distinction to make that it's reparative or it's not, or that's a kind of simple attitude. How did you approach the subject? Did you actually go out there? I mean, did you know much about the subject? Did you do that? You... We, we started working on it, and I, I went out and marked it, and I, I found it to be much, much more interesting than I thought it could be. Uh, I mean, seeing a plan of the place, you know, seeing that plan of the slab blocks, certainly from a, from a British perspective, you have a certain uh, kind of understanding of what, that, what those spaces might be like. Uh, when you get there, you find how stranded it is from the rest of Geneva, uh, from, and, and and the and just the strange topographies that are working across it. I don't know. I, mean, it's, it's, I think the question about distance is interesting, and I think the, uh, the way in which one I think one of the reasons one deals with uh, the competition sites is to kind of take something that maybe is beyond um, one's normal area of concern. I mean, on one hand, there is a frustration at not knowing the political issues that the specific social concerns and needs of that place and not knowing its uh, um, its culture, not knowing how it lives daily. That's frustrating, particularly if that's, if that's your uh, more regular interest architecturally. But it's also, I think, very liberating. And I found not, you know, that only one of us went there and I didn't, I didn't know it in the same way to report it. I think that, that relationship This is very interesting. Did, did you do that consciously or not? Um, or was that pure? I think in advance we expected that to be interesting because I'm aware of the, the fact that it's often mess, it's often, you often can only start to react to a, the issues in a project once you're removed from the place and you have abstracted some of it. But in, in terms of the reason that you set this thing up, we, we actually took the view that we used it as a tool. Obviously, as you, you've ended up, but specifically, I mean, Dominic and Joe actually operate from the Netherlands anyway. If they went to the site, got to know it much better. I hadn't seen the place and it had existed. So um, there were several views that came together, and as an interaction, that, that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. With you, for me, actually, from both projects, was interesting is that 
uh, even though well, I think in your case it's different because most of the team was in the Netherlands already. But e the let's say the graphic technique, it is very Dutch. Right. And in your case, I would say that it's very Swiss. I don't know how <laughs> does it happen. Being both, well, the question is one of that website was drawn in the even drier way. It was absolutely you know it was intentional. But was was it intentional in your case? I mean, it, it has, I mean, the whole thing has, the project has a, a sort of essential condensed quality. I mean, it was, it was, it was uh, drawn very quickly, and, you know, the conversation between myself and Mark was interesting, but I don't think it's a, a, necessarily a substantial competition entry, but that wasn't the, the way in which we condensed it. It would be nice to have spent more time in it, but it, I mean, it's the product of a, you know, just a just a gesture which gets drawn, and, and that's it. Um, I think because time's getting on, actually, and it's been a very long evening. Um, I think rather than continue, I think it, we should probably uh, call it a day. Um, I of those people who are left, I think um, from my point of view. The purpose with these evenings is to start to uh, I think open up discussion about work, as I said at the beginning, as it's, as it's being made rather than um, uh, waiting and encouraging a kind of fr free debate. And this school and this room seems to be uh, the, the place where in London where it can happen most easily. I hope that um, this is the last one for this year, but I hope that next year um, we can uh, do more and um, so respond to uh, um, shifts in practice and shifts in speculation as they happen. Um, and uh, I hope you, that um, you'll all come to those. Um, thank you, everybody who's participated this evening uh, presenting their work. Um, I know that it's, uh, it, it was quick. And uh, I, um, I think what, what we'll try, um, shut up, Adam. <laughs> um, we'll try and get this going again next year. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>